So he mastered these many different forms of writing, which not everybody can do, even if they're an accomplished writer. And he did some of that greatest writing in crisis moments of his life. I mean, really difficult personal times in his life, which is not uncommon for a lot of great artists, but it's certainly true here, like the early 1850s. His whole life is coming apart in the 1850s. He can't even feed his family. His newspaper almost dies every week or every month. Uh, he goes through this terrible public breakup with Garrison, this personal scandal. But he produces his greatest speech, his one novella, and his greatest long-form masterpiece in Bondage and Freedom and some of the best editorials ever written in the history of abolitionism, all in a three- or four-year period. While he was having, I'm convinced, a kind of nervous breakdown. Hi, friends, and welcome back to At the End of the Tunnel. Today, I'm experimenting. I am going to do something I haven't done before on this podcast. It's something that I've been wanting to do since I started At the End of the Tunnel. And I've been fortunate to have some really amazing guests come on and share their backstory of starting their movement. But I was thinking, why limit the guests to people who are currently on the planet? And no, I'm not talking about aliens or anything like that. I'm referring to people who are no longer alive, but when they were alive, they created incredible movements. And one historical figure that I've been obsessed with ever since I read the first of his three autobiographies is Frederick Douglass, who was of course born a slave, then he became one of the most prominent abolitionists of his time, and at one point he was even heralded as the most famous black man in the world and the most photographed person in all of America. And this happened in the 1800s. So you can imagine there were no dull moments in his life. And to share Douglas's fascinating life story, I'm honored to have on the podcast today the world's foremost expert on the life of Frederick Douglass. He's the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning Douglass biography called Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which was an incredible read that combines stories and insights from Douglass's three autobiographies. Plus, it draws from a recently discovered repository of Frederick Douglass's letters and papers from the latter third of his life, which had not previously been written about. He's the Sterling Professor of African American Studies and the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University, not to mention he's an award-winning author of seven other books, plus multiple op-eds, and his name is Professor David Blight. After I read Prophet of Freedom, I reached out to Professor Blight just on a lark and I told him what I wanted to do, which was to have him come onto the podcast and essentially be a conduit for Frederick Douglass's life. And he was intrigued. So we scheduled a time, we hopped on a Zoom call, and what you're going to hear is me going through the same life trajectory with Professor Blight, but he's going to be talking about the life of Frederick Douglass. And what I love about Professor Blight's approach is that he doesn't sound like a professor. He sounds like a regular person who happens to be an excellent storyteller. And in fact, his voice kind of reminds me of the actor Brian Cranston's who plays Walter White in Breaking Bad. Anyway, I think once you hear our discussion, if you don't know the details of Frederick Douglass's life, you're going to become obsessed as well. Or at least you'll think about picking up the book to help fill in some of the gaps. Because more people, especially here in America, need to know Douglas's life story. There's so many parallels to what he talked about, and what he stood for, versus what we're experiencing right now with racism and social justice in America. Douglas, of course, escaped from slavery and he found himself in Massachusetts, which was a hotbed for abolitionists. And by the way, if you don't know what an abolitionist is, there were people who spoke out against slavery. Douglas became a protege for the biggest abolitionist of his time, which was William Lloyd Garrison, and he was groomed by Garrison as a speaker. And then eventually, he eclipsed his mentor to become the most sought-after speaker of his time. Yet, he would get into countless fights and brawls, and he experienced overt racism all throughout his speaking career, with the exception of a couple trips to Europe. He published a newspaper called The North Star, which struggled for many years. He participated in the Underground Railroad. He became a Washington insider in his later years, and he worked directly with multiple presidents. 
So Professor Blight and I are going to talk about the span of Frederick Douglass's incredible life and what it was like for him to publish his first book at 26 and to give thousands of talks all over the world and what made him such a highly sought after speaker. We talk about what kind of family dynamic he had and so much more. And I'm excited to introduce you to the life of Frederick Douglass through the extensively researched work of Professor David Blight. I think you're really going to love this experiment. And so we're going to begin the conversation with Professor Blight and I talking about his expectations for the Pulitzer Prize winning book that he wrote on the life of Frederick Douglass. Did you anticipate this level of reception for the book that you were writing? No. With with all of this Pulitzer and everything? Uh, oh, no, no, no. You, you know, you, you have little dreams here and there of whatever. But no, I got very lucky, I think, with the timing, given what's happening in American society. Trump and Trumpism became kind of a, I mean, I gave, I don't know how many book talks. I'm still doing them like this way. Yeah hundreds and Trump was almost a subtext every time. Right. So in Q and A people, you know, used to, as a historian, you used to be able to bat away the question, what would Lincoln do? What would Douglas think? And just say, ah, it's counterfactual. We don't do that. You can't do that anymore. No. People want answers. How can Frederick Douglass help me understand what's happening right now on the streets? There are some answers to that. If you're willing to read, you know, <laughs> right. But no, I didn't anticipate all of this. And I've learned a lot through this process about however cynical we become, there's a great deal of hunger out there for good history, for historical grounding. You know, that tends to be among a self-selected, educated population. But I had lots and lots of audiences of just regular people who read books. And that's encouraging. You said good history. What do you mean by good history? I guess it's history that, number one, tells a good story. Hmm. Tells an engaging narrative that takes you somewhere about people. Not just about theories or forces, but people. And then it's well-researched. It's history people can find a way to trust because they can see this came from, I mean, the average reader doesn't scour your footnotes. Historians do, <laughs> but they need a way to understand this, this came from somewhere. This was really research. This, this, this took years to do and so on and so forth. So it's history that really engages people with the questions that are most important about, about their country, their lives, uh, the issues of the day, and lots of history is. We always used to joke about how, you know, the medievalists are never as relevant. On the other hand, sometimes I have a a medievalist colleague here at Yale, Paul Friedman, who's now one of the great scholars in the world of the history of food. And he started Mm. by writing about food. He's he's got a bestseller out about, well, granted, it's about American restaurants, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's history that, that, that engages people, real people now, not just our colleagues in the academy. And that's who I write for now. I've, well, actually, I still write with one eye on my footnotes because I have rules and training and I, I do care what my profession thinks. But I want to reach real people. I want to reach people who read books. I want to reach people who go to museums. I want to reach people who love taking their kids to a historic site. Uh, I want to reach people who are at least open to understanding that slavery is a central threat of American history. And and lots of people now finally get that. Not everybody. Everybody never will. But good history is also the history that tends to hold up for a while. Hmm. It holds up first through the scrutiny of the profession itself, meaning book reviews and so forth and so on, but then holds up as something people want to know about for some period of time, maybe not forever. There's a distance, though, isn't there, between the scholarship produced in the academy, which is so important, and the books that sell, the books that really get read widely, and then, of course, the books that might get a film contract. There's a big distance between some of that. But there is a way 
and I've had my own models for this, there is a way to write really well-researched history for the broad reader. It can be done. Was, was Bruce Cadden one of your influences in that regard? <laughs> You've read up, yeah. Uh, indeed he was. You know, I, I used to be careful where I admitted that. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the academy, ooh, Bruce Cadden, wasn't he just that popularist, you know, and all that? Yeah. He was the first historian I read as a teenager, knowingly. Mm-hmm. One of your favorite pastimes was visiting historical sites. Yes, yes, as a kid. I uh, could never get enough of that. I I mean, I grew up in an industrial city, completely working class, Flint, Michigan. My dad got two weeks vacation a year from his job in the factory. Typical of a working class guy, he would plan that vacation uh, wherever it was. But early on, I convinced my parents to, as we always said, go out east. We didn't. We never went to lakes in Michigan. That sort of stuff. I never. I never went fishing. I just didn't do any of that, which is the thing people do in Michigan. I got my parents to go east. I had a hook because uh, my father's brother lived just outside D.C. and worked in the government, so we could go see some relatives. But I got him to go to historic sites, Civil War sites, D.C. I mean, with all its museums. I was a kid who just. Drop me off at the Smithsonian Museum and I'll see you later. And I don't even know for sure exactly where that came from. My parents had a sort of interest in this, but not much. I had a few teachers, particularly when I reached high school, who really did influence me. I had two great high school history teachers. They didn't teach me anything about slavery and all of that because they didn't know how. But they did get me excited about history and why it matters. Causes and consequences. Exactly. That's, uh, <laughs> that's what old Mildred Hodges taught us. <laughs> causes and consequences. And I didn't know what she was doing, but I do now. You know, she was trying to tell us that's what matters about history. We never did any events. Yeah. In fact, I was starved for events. Maybe that's why I got interested in the Civil War. But I loved the sense of place about history, I think, as a kid without exactly knowing why that's important. It was Civil War sites in part that caught me, but also other kinds of sites, particularly around Washington and and anywhere else that we could go. That doesn't mean we went very many places. I mean, it was pretty simple in that sense. I never went abroad until I was in my 30s. I think as a, as a kid, there, there are different ways to get connected to this. I don't know how it happened to you. Sometimes it's a teacher, sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's stories within a family. I think that's for a lot of people what it is. For me, I had to kind of develop it through my own imagination. And that's uh, sometimes maybe the best way. And Bruce Catton was a factor because I was reading him when I was, I don't know, 15, 16, 17. Was that through old. school or was that something you just kind of stumbled upon in the library? I stumbled upon it, and I don't even remember exactly how. I mean, I don't remember anybody saying you should read Bruce Catton. (laughs) But somehow I started picking up books like Stillness at Appomattox and Mr. Lincoln's Army and Glory Road, those er those early books he wrote in the 50s. And then later I started reading the books he wrote in the 60s. But it was narrative history. It could have been about anything. Bruce Catton was the kind of writer, and I've written about him now, He just had a beautiful sense of narrative. It came out of his journalism. He'd been a journalist for a long time before he, he was almost 50 before he wrote his first history book. And he'd been a speechwriter for Henry Wallace in the Democratic Party. He he actually came from liberal Democratic tradition, and and yet people always cast him as this conservative military historian. No, he wasn't. But he had a narrative style that just captured you. And I wasn't that good a reader even then, but he captured me. My summer job used to be working in a recreation job. I ran a baseball center summer after summer after summer, you know, organizing teams and umpiring and all that. But when I got a rain day, I got to go read Bruce Catton, which was by far (laughs) (laughs) more uh, desirable in many ways. Well, that's at least where it began. And then you were introduced to Douglas in uh, high school, for, to teaching high school. Well, teaching, yeah. I don't think I learned one word about Douglas in high school. I was in high school in the 60s. 
I graduated high school in 67. There was no real black history taught that I recall. It was in college that I first encountered him. I took the first ever black history course taught at Michigan State. It was taught by a man named Les Rout, who was a Brazilianist, Latin Americanist historian of quite some note. He wrote books on Juan Perón, and he wrote books on the coffee industry, but he was African American. And that, I, I suspect they just said, hey, Les, we got to offer this course. You're teaching it. And it was amazing. <laughs> it was all new, probably mostly new to him. You know, he was looking it up and teaching it the next day. It was probably 68. It could have been 69. I'm not sure. But God, you know, was, look at this part of our history. And it was 68 and 69. I mean, look what's going on in the world. Assassinations, the Vietnam War, civil rights movement, black power movement. And I'm like 19. And why is this called the second reconstruction? What the hell is the first reconstruction? All those things. You know, all I wanted to do at that point was be a, be a high school teacher. And so I started teaching in 1971. The wave of the 60s was all around us. My first year teaching. I mean, we had police in the hall. This was in Flint. I was in a big urban high school with almost 3,000 students. We had police in the halls. We, I mean, we had everything a, a city could throw into a high school that was about 50% black, 50% white. It had a lot of middle class. It had classic automobile industry, working class kids. And we were creating a course called Black History. It was time to do that. And we didn't know what we were doing, but we, we did. And I got the school to order I don't know, maybe 100 or 200 copies, the library of John Hope Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom. That was the one textbook that I knew about. And I also got them to order Kenneth Stamp's The Peculiar Institution, which was pretty much the one book I knew about on slavery. And that's what we read. <laughs> and God knows what else we did with that course. And, the, you know, the scholastic companies and all these companies that produce stuff for teachers were all in the very first stage of trying to create stuff for teaching black history. Most of it was just biographical. You get pictures of famous people. And that's when I first taught about Douglas. But again, not very much because I didn't know much. And his book had just come out of being dormant for a hundred years or something like that, right? The narrative. Yeah. The narrative was, was out of print until 1960. It was put back in print in the sixties, about three different editions by 1970. But yeah, nobody, nobody read that book, by and large, except in some black schools and colleges for a century. And now it's, of course, you know, obligatory text and so many courses and so on. But when I went off to grad school, when I finally decided to you know, make that break, I wanted to study abolitionism, the coming of the Civil War. I particularly wanted to look at black abolitionists. It seemed like they'd never been studied. That's just what I wanted to do by then. But it was the high school teaching that sort of honed that for me. I did that for seven years. And I also did an MA degree in history part-time at Michigan State. One course at a time, I'd drive down to East Lansing. And that's how I figured out, hey, maybe I can do this. This is what I want to do. And so I just threw good sense to the wind and wandered off to graduate school. What was it about Douglas and, and that era that really attracted you? You know, it had to be at least two things. It was the history that so helped explain this period I came of age in, the 60s mm. and the 70s. I mean, good God. Nobody in my family ever talked about this. In fact, I had, I'll be honest with you, I had a couple of uncles who were blatant racist. I had one uncle who was happy to tell you why he had moved to the suburbs. He was tolerable for about an hour on holidays, you know, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, I came of age at a time when this is what was happening to the world and the country. I wanted to know about that. Frankly, it's a deep, great, important story. More and more I got serious about American history, I realized what so many people are now realizing, and that is the slavery and the coming of the Civil War and the abolition of slavery and Reconstruction and all of its aftermath. I mean, we're, we're still living the legacies of Reconstruction every day. I began to realize in a, in a more sophisticated way, this is the central threat of American history. 
And it's a dramatic, fascinating, important part of it to teach about. And here I was teaching classrooms that were at least half black in a big industrial city. It was kind of all new to everybody. I mean, I was a high school teacher the week that Roots showed on television, Mm -hmm. 76 or 77. I think the book came out in 76 and the film 77. And oh my God, it was like watching the microcosm of society in front of me learn about slavery on television every night. And, you know, we, we nearly had violence in the halls over this. They were, they were fighting over Kunta Kinte. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to believe today, maybe for some people. But I was attracted, I think, again, to uh, the importance of the subject, but also the story embedded in it. This was a story that, that had newness all over it. And, of course, in the 70s, I didn't know it at first, but the, as, I, as I started doing a master's degree and getting much more serious about reading, and as I began to think graduate school, the 70s is when this revolution in the scholarship of slavery exploded. It mm-hmm. just exploded. In the, it began in the 60s, but it really exploded in the 70s. I mean, you had books about slavery appear on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, that, hell, that doesn't even happen now. And to be in that field was to somehow be at the vanguard. You know, you were going to be at the vanguard of what really, really mattered. Today, graduate students, uh, I don't know, you know, they're too, so many of them are into kind of theoretical trends that they think are somehow obligatory. But they, too, are following questions and issues that reflect their own moment. Part of my whole sh- spiel is kind of showing how historical figures and also contemporary figures, in hindsight, when you connect the dots, were essentially on a crash course towards their purpose, their mission, their path. And I I don't find it ironic that you have become either the foremost expert or one of the leading experts on the life of Frederick Douglass. And then having stumbled upon this collection of scrapbooks and the Evans collection and yeah. it's just it's pretty remarkable i mean the, the whole story behind it is just i mean maybe i'm using too much confirmation bias in all of this but i feel like at that point in time when you were probably studying black history and then going and teaching it the next day in high school you were on a your own kind of collision course to bringing the life of douglas yeah. into a into a greater sense of context for all of us and kind of merging together all of the biographies and that collection in uh, Savannah, Georgia. So I wanted to start off by something you mentioned about that. You said before, I've heard it a few times actually, never trust somebody who writes three biographies. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, it means they're, uh, especially if they're well written and they're good. <laughs> uh, a great memoirist is imposing him or herself on you and particularly on his or her biographers. That's kind of the point of memoir. It's to control your own story. It's to stabilize and control your own past. Why would any of us write our own memoir? Well, it might be because we want our children to know this and this and this and that, but more likely it's a deep impulse to put the past in order, control Mm -hmm. it, and therefore maybe control our own memory later. Well, Douglas was acutely aware of that from day one. I mean, he writes the first narrative, obviously, when he's 27 years old. He writes the second one when he's 37. Well, he publishes when he's 37 years old. And the second one, Bondage and Freedom, is really his long-form masterpiece. That's a more mature writer. That's a much more political book. And then he writes a third one uh, late in life that is a long summation, but also a kind of settling of scores, of name-dropping, of you know, and, and it's control over his own story. He has a lot of control over that. And the first two had enormous readership. They really were bestsellers of a, a 19th century version of bestsellers. Third one didn't sell that well because it was this big lumpy book. So, yeah, that idea of not trusting. And other, all I mean by that, though, is as a scholar and a biographer, you've got to get underneath, inside over and through those autobiographies. They're incredibly valuable. They're a stem 
for understanding Douglas's life, but you've got to work your way through them, under them, and around them, because he's manipulating us on every page. And of course, there are lots of aspects of his life he just doesn't talk about, namely his family, <clears throat> his children, his wives, <laughs> his relationships, and to a great extent, even his friendships. That's just not what he's going to write about. Part of that is 19th century convention, but part of it is Douglas's control. So there's, you know, there, there's a self-made hero at the center of Douglas's life story in the autobiographies. And there's a central character, <laughs> and it's him, make no mistake. You know, it's, and it's in no way, doesn't even begin to approach any kind of tell-all autobiography, although they didn't tend to write those kind in the 19th century. It's Douglas's self-made myth in a way that comes through. And it's one of the reasons it's, it's great literature. I mean, it really is the fashionings and self-fashioning of a life out of slavery. You know, what could be a more American story than the reinvention of life out of human bondage? I would love for you where you see appropriate to kind of make that distinction between Douglas, the sort of mythology or the character versus Douglas, the actual man, having studied so in-depthly his, his life. Let's start with young Douglas. Obviously, he's born a slave. He's born into slavery. And so there are a lot of commonalities between the young Douglas and any other person who's a slave. But something that indicates a future towards oratory and writing and speaking is that he stumbles upon the alphabet and then eventually towards his book that he ends up bartering for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's the seizure of language for this kid when he was, you know, from like eight years, seven, eight years old into his teens that there's a little bit of mystery in it, like there is about all great writers and artists, you know, exactly when do they find their destiny and all that stuff. But he found in language something he could do very well. And of course, he was taught his alphabet by his mistress, Sophia Auld in Baltimore, for more than a year. She taught him almost daily, it appears. She treated him practically like a son. He's only eight years old and, and an orphan. He, was, he welcomed any kind of parental care he could get. And her parental care was in the form of teaching him to read until, you know, her husband stopped it, but they couldn't stop him. And I think the way I try to explain this in the book, and as he gets a little older and he starts encountering all these little white boys in the streets of Baltimore who are all these immigrant kids are mostly Irish, and he's 10 years old, 11 years old, and they, and they think he's cool. You know, they, they don't understand, why are you a slave, he, he claims, they said. And they got this book, Columbian Order, and he wants to get this book, Columbian Order, and he wants to test out, you know, his own ability. Every kid, you think about it, we're always looking for something we were good at. You know, whatever it might be. It might be dribbling behind your back. It might be, you know, throwing a baseball, which it was for me until I realized it wasn't good enough. But this kid was good with language. He could get up and use words. And he you, you having, made the Columbian Order sound like it was like the spy, the first Spider-Man comic book or something like that. Was <laughs> what, what was the what was the draw well, to this book out of book. all the other books in the world? Yeah, it's an amazing book. He encounters when he's about eleven. He gets his own copy by the time he's twelve. Columbian Order was the second best-selling school reader in the United States. McGuffey readers sold more. But it went through some 27 or 28 editions over 50-some years, first published way back in 1797. It's a collection of speeches or orations, both classical from the Greeks and Romans, and then from the Enlightenment, British and American. And it has an anti-slavery egalitarian tone to how it was organized by the man who compiled it, whose name was Caleb Bingham who was from Connecticut and then ended up creating schools in Massachusetts. And he created this as a reader for kids, for children. It even has invented dialogues in it, which Douglas writes about. And one is a dialogue where a, a, a young slave actually convinces his master to free him just by logic. But most important, the book opens with about a 20-page 
manual of oratory, how to do oratory. It's from the most simplistic aspects of like how to position your body and your shoulders, how to use your hands, how to use your neck. And then it goes into how to modulate your voice, starting low, reaching crescendos. But then it even has, it goes into the more complicated parts of like moral philosophy. I think Caleb Bingham had read Aristotle on oratory because, or it didn't really have to, I guess, but it, it goes into how a, a true orator must not only have style, but has to reach the moral heart of his audience, has to gain access to their moral heart with a story and a message. And it's written for young people. Douglas just seized on this thing. And he used it well, for himself. But he ends up using it on the Freeland farm there on the Eastern shore when he's about 17. And he, after he spends this nearly a year with Edward Covey where he has the hell beat out of him, he goes to this place where he never gets beaten, but he starts organizing this Sunday gathering of, the, he called it his band of brothers. He claimed he had at one point over 30 slaves, mostly teenagers. Some of these guys would have been in their 20s. They're, they're the laborers. And almost all of them are illiterate, except him. Talk about power. They go, they go off in the woods. He, he uses the Bible and the Columbian order to start teaching oratory. That's power for a teenager over was his that, fellow teenagers. Was that something that he would have to carefully guard in Baltimore? Or was he, was he, was he pretty open about the fact that he could read? Well, after uh, Hugh Auld, the surrogate owner, Hugh Auld was the brother of Douglas's owner, Thomas Auld, mm-hmm. back on the Eastern Shore. After he'd kind of worked things out with Hugh Auld and he reaches his teenage years, of course, he goes back and forth between Baltimore and the Eastern Shore. He spent nine of his 20 years as a slave in Baltimore, though, because it makes that question crucial, because Baltimore is a city a great maritime port. He works in the docks and the shipyards and encounters all kinds of violence and trouble, but he also learns a craft, many crafts, and he learns hard labor. But he spends all of his, the rest of his time uh, living in and among a free black community. There were about 3,000 slaves in Baltimore in 1838, the year he escaped but there were about 17,000 free blacks. They had churches, they had debating societies, they had their own little alternative economy. That's where he met Anna Murray. And he even got engaged with a debating society when he's 18 or 19 years old. And he meets this old black preacher named Charles Lawson, you know, kind of a storefront preacher. Douglas tells us he sat for hours and hours, especially on Sundays and just, read the Bible with old Lawson out loud. That's how Douglas got language in his head from the cadences of the King James Bible. And he, he names four churches that he attended. He names the preachers. Two of them are white preachers, two of them black preachers. He, he remembered what he liked and disliked about each of the preachers. So he'd been well introduced to these homiletic traditions, sermonic traditions, and the biblical story from the pulpit and from his reading. But again, exactly where this talent with language comes from is not easy to determine. Because, you know, if it's a Ralph Waldo Emerson, we know he he was born to education and he went to Harvard. You know, if it's whatever, name a great writer who had lots of education, you can begin to trace. There's no education here. There's just, there's the will. It's sort of the the will to power or the will to be as the will to speak and eventually to write. He's not a writer while he's a slave. I mean, that comes later. That's much more Mm -hmm. difficult. And he needed help with that. But he seized on language. He collected newspapers, he tells us. He collected anything he could read. And it was his escape, too, his mental escape. It was his way of imagining that there is a world out there. There's a world beyond Baltimore Harbor and these ships, and the people in that city. And every kid goes through that, too. I mean, every kid in the world today, wherever they are, is practicing their imagination about something, hopefully something useful to them, (laughs) you know. 
the way I end up trying to explain that is that Douglas found his, his one mode of power quite uh, fully while he was still a slave, and that is that he could get up and talk. And so I wanna, he escaped from slavery, he'd already been preaching in the woods to his band of brothers. I want to put this a little bit into context for people who aren't as familiar with the you know, slave society, because it sounds like Douglas had a, quite a bit of leeway and freedom going you know, around. And I know there was one botched escape attempt and he didn't get like his foot cut off like Kuta Kente right. in the book Roots. He got sent to Baltimore, which is like he had ultimate freedom he in Baltimore. Sent to Mississippi and we'd never hear of him. You know. Right. But I want to talk about Edward Covey and that experience just in terms of his own transformation. What, what was his, he had a realization yeah. when he fought back. And then in terms of going back to Baltimore and being less than 24 hours travel away from freedom, yeah. but real freedom, I'm wondering how prevalent that was for any of those 3,000 slaves in Baltimore to dream like that and to maybe even or how risky was it for him to actually do that? Uh, extremely risky, and only the rare few did it or attempted it. He had some help from the community a little bit. He had help from Anna. But it was a scheme they hatched basically on their own. Now, it was extremely if, – if he gets caught in that escape plot out of Baltimore, it's hard to believe that the two all brothers wouldn't have just sold him south because they could have got a lot of money for him. But earlier, as you mentioned, uh, this first escape plot when he's on the Freeland farm, he's about 18. He and a group of about four other guys plot to steal some boats and they're going to row their way up the Chesapeake to Baltimore and beyond. Uh, it was not a good plan. <laughs> Probably they have never made it in all likelihood. They get caught. He's taken to Baltimore. He's put in, put in the jail of the old courthouse, which is still there. It's one of those places I love to visit. <laughs> Spends two weeks there fully probably believing all of this is going to sell him south. That's what happened, usually. And uh, he'd be gone. But all makes a deal with him. I'll send you to Baltimore. I'll free you on your 21st birthday. Who knows if he meant that. Turns out Douglas didn't believe him. It's the best luck Douglas ever had. First best luck is being sent to Baltimore in the first place. Second best luck is being sent back when he was 18 years old, where he did have a good deal of autonomy. He finally had a deal with Hewald in Baltimore that he got to keep little portions of the money he made, little portions. And then he'd, you know, he'd work in the docks and give the money. I mean, imagine what that does. You know, you're now 18 and you're smart and you've been reading all, I mean, you You've been reading about this in the Bible and a lot of other places, and I work to give this man money? Are you kidding me? He, he has some sections. It's even better in Bondage and Freedom, second autobiography, where he talks about how galling it was to have to turn that cash over to old man old. But he did have this relative freedom of movement throughout the city of Baltimore, and I mean, when I was writing this, I got out a lot of old maps of Baltimore. I wanted to know the street formations. I wanted to know how far it was from here to there. Because it's kind of important. You realize that that church was only five blocks from where he lived. That church was only seven blocks from where he lived. Anna Murray, where she worked in the house of a white family, was only three blocks up that way. You know, It was all in a, in a pretty relatively small area of Fells Point much of which is still there, the old Fells Point, some of which is still there. But this was the world in which Douglas hatched the dream of escape. But even this idea that you could get on three boats and three trains and be in New York in 36 hours, freedom. I mean, what, was, what did that mean? It meant he had no plan, no money, and no friends. <laughs> but it worked out only because he managed to find David Ruggles and this vigilance committee in New York, which he did not know about before he got there. At least he hmm. says he didn't. And by the way, they had this amazing plan where we don't know how, because Anna, of course, was not literate. But once he is secure in New York, after about 36 hours, maybe a bit more, at David Ruggles' house, he writes a letter back to Baltimore, exactly to whom we don't know, and Anna was immediately informed. She was all ready to go. She had her bag packed. She got on the same train. 
And she took the same risk he did, even though she was free. If she gets caught in this plot, her fate is not going to be good either. Who knows what would have happened to her. So that woman had the same bravery he did. She packed a purple dress in her trunk. I learned that from a little narrative their daughter wrote. And they got married. She got married in a purple dress in Ruggles' parlor on the moment. He's 20, she's 23. And then they just head off to New Bedford, Massachusetts, because Ruggles told them that's a good, safe place for fugitive slaves. That's how he were, began. That's how he began were, his free life. <laughs> were they dating in Baltimore or were they were just friends that he was over uh, the, the details of that are not really known, but they clearly had a romance going mm-hmm. because she no doubt. I mean, she meets this, this frankly, dashing, good-looking, stunning 19- and 20-year-old guy who's obviously bright as hell and has got plans. Now, again, we just don't know. Anna never wrote. You know, Anna never sat down and told us, here's why I followed Frederick. You know, we have to kind of get it that other ways. No, but they, they had a romance already before the escape. There's no question about that. I I don't think she just followed him because he was a good friend. I mean, she's giving up. (laughs) She's risking everything in her life for this this guy. And if she's going to follow this dude to New York, it it better be an attempt at permanence. (laughs) And talk about that incident on the slave breakers plantation and how that changed his perspective on pacifism versus violence later on in life. Yeah, well, this is one of the places where the mastery of autobiography, Douglas's own story about this, does collide with the details and facts. But Covey's real. There's no question. He Mm -hmm. he existed. There are lots of records about him. Uh, His land, we know where his land was. We We know how much land he had. We know a lot about him. He was real. Exactly if that, how that fight happened. That fight is, you know, is literary lore now, right? Douglas says they fought for two hours. I doubt it, but it doesn't matter. But in Douglas's telling of his own story, it becomes a resurrection. Mm-hmm. It's really told through a resurrection metaphor. You have seen how a man was made a slave. I will now show you how a slave became a man. And it's kind of a classic American story of resurrection through violence, manhood through self-defense and violence. And Douglas thrilled to tell that story, even later on the stump, you know, the day he kicked Edward Covey's tail. And therefore, I mean, the real moral of the story for Douglas was, of course, Covey never laid a hand on me again because I ruined his reputation. Perhaps so. We don't know for sure. What we do know is he did spend those nine months on Covey's land. Mm -hmm. And under the the pain and the the despair of Covey's violence or potential violence. And it drew out of him in remembrance. I got to remember, he's writing this after the fact up in Massachusetts when he writes the narrative. But some of the most beautiful, lyrical, metaphorical writing in the narrative is his descriptions of being under Covey. The famous descriptions of the white sailing ships on the Chesapeake, the despair of a teenager who believes his life is lost, totally trapped in this system forever, and how the sailing ships represent visions of you know, their white-robed vessels sailing around the world. It's just, it's gorgeous the way he can write that when he's only in his 20s. Clearly, that experience brought out of him a prose that was born of a searing experience. Exactly the details of it we don't know, and one might argue it doesn't necessarily matter. But to him, it set up this issue about pacifism and uses of violence, which would become a big deal when he's an abolitionist. He spends his first several years as a Garrisonian abolitionist under the tutelage and teachings of William Lloyd Garrison. And I don't say that as a negative necessarily. Garrison truly did discover Douglas 
and Douglas learned a great deal from Garrison. He loved Garrison. But Garrison was a staunch pacifist, and one of the reasons, only one of several, they eventually broke apart, was that Douglas could no longer toe that line. Personally is one thing, but more broadly, politically, Douglas could no longer toe that line and argue that all resistance to slavery must remain nonviolent. By the early, in the wake of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, he could no longer sustain that position. And he participated himself by his count in the retrieval and moving of at least 100 fugitive slaves through his own house in Rochester on Canada. Now, you have to be willing to court violence of one kind or another if you're going to do that. And you're taking tremendous risk if you're going to do that. And his whole family took that risk. Let's talk a little bit about his entry into speaking. So can you just give a little context into what what did it mean to be a speaker during that that time Mm -hmm. in the 1830s and 1840s? Was that heralded as a big Mm -hmm. profession that people aspired towards? Was it, would you have been nerve wracked to get up in front of an audience and speak Mm -hmm. to someone as a former slave? Like, what was that like for him, do you imagine? Well, to the last part, absolutely, yes. Douglas tells us he, quote, quaked in his shoes. (laughs) <laughs> the first time he spoke to a predominantly white audience, which was on Nantucket, the, the anti-slavery convention that Garrison invites him to in August of 1841, where he, you know, he's, he's 23 years old. I mean, think about that. You know, what are any of us ready to do when we're 23? But this was the golden age of oratory. It really was. I mean, a lot of people may know that, but... You know, oratory in Congress, it was stylistic. You know, politicians would wave their arms and they would point to the sky and they would use all this incredible flowering rhetoric. And if you were Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, you would lace it with quotes from Latin and maybe even Greek and so on. Now, Douglas never did that. But it was a golden age of oratory as performance. I mean, there weren't all the games in town. And this is why abolitionists took to it so effectively. Abolitionists used two primary weapons. One was oratory, and the other was the printing press, newspapers. Mm. And they are, the, they are the prototypical, original, great American reform movement. But that's, that's what their methods were. That's what they had. You know, today it's obviously social media and all the rest. It's <laughs> impossible to imagine Douglas sending a tweet Gosh, but anyway, <laughs> Douglas became one of the greatest. And this is why that, that little Colombian order was important. He honed skills as an orator, as a performative orator, and he became a great mimic. He would get up and do these performances where he would mimic slaveholding preachers. In fact, his most sought after, most common, famous speech that he gave in his first like four years out on the circuit became known as the slaveholder's sermon, where he would go into this this performance of the slaveholding, slaves be loyal to your masters. You know, he would quote all that biblical stuff. Sometimes he would even perform John C. Calhoun by name. He would use Calhoun in that way, and he'd kind of stomp around the stage, and audiences loved it. In fact, I have a case in the book somewhere in, I don't know, 80, 43, or 44. It's a little press report, and Douglas is out. You know, these abolitionist meetings had a form to them. There would be three, four, five speakers. They'd have a resolution to speak to or against, and they'd all get up and do their thing. And it's often very biblical. But at one of these gatherings, some guy in the back just shouts out, hey, Fred, do the sermon. And sure enough, he just breaks. And sometimes he'd have a Bible with him, and he'd grab the Bible, you know, and he'd, it was a great performance. People loved it. Now, later on, he would do that with other topics as well. So he learned at a very young age a kind of a stagecraft that he clearly had a skill for. And at first, he was always a kind of second or third billing in his first year or two out on the circuit. He was traveling at one point commonly with Abby Kelly, who was the first great woman star of the abolitionist movement, and two or three others. But before long, the audiences wanted to hear Frederick. (laughs) And it developed, you know, inevitably a lot of rivalries because he was really good at this. Plus, he had the obvious advantage 
the day in and day out. He's telling his own stories. He's, right. He's the authentic former slave. He's telling you the Covey story. He's right. telling you about you all denying him the right to read. He's reaching his audience's heart because these are stories about me. And that's what they wanted him to do. And he was brilliant at it. And he enjoyed doing that for a while. But after a while, he's this growing young intellectual and he wants to kind of deal with a few other issues than just telling my story over and over and over. He got tired of doing it. When he gave that first sermon and he was discovered by the Garrisonian abolitionists, was that a hotbed for abolition in that part of Massachusetts? Like, was there some sort of prophetic well, section the happening there? Yeah, well, Boston was, although <laughs> Garrison was nearly killed in 1835 by a mob. So there were always anti-abolition mobs out there. But parts of New England were relatively safe for abolitionists, but no one should ever romanticize this. <laughs> abolitionists right. were not popular. They, in fact, they, they tried very hard not to be. One of the methods Douglas actually learned from Garrison, and by the way, you know, some of Garrison's ideology was impossible to follow and all of that, but Garrison was the real thing. I mean, he was an authentic radical. And one of the goals of these gatherings sometimes was to prompt an audience to react, even if it meant they were going to throw a few things. A few things thrown at you was a successful meeting. Like tomatoes and rotten eggs. And yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> eggs, God. One time he had a live pig thrown at him on an altar. <laughs> and I, found, I mean, yeah, I, it's, it's too good to be true, but it, it happened. But, but it was getting an audience riled up mm. was part of the point. These were not namby-pamby pious meetings by any means. This was moral suasion after your soul. He learned that from Garrison. He really did. Now, he, he's going to need to go further than that, though. He, he wants to change the whole political culture of the country eventually, and he's not alone in that. Once anti-slavery reached its political phase in the 1850s, Douglas finds his own tortured way to shoulder up to it, although he, he found it very difficult to get that close to the Republican Party until later. But, but again, back to the original point, I think it's important for people to know this was the golden age of oratory. And I mean, in Congress, there were some very famous, Daniel Webster you know, was very famous as an orator. And on the abolition circuit, Wendell Phillips was known as just, he was called the golden trumpet. People would just show up. And eventually Douglas became, and I say this in the book more than once, he became a kind of an American wonder, like a wonder of the American world. Foreign visitors, Americans, and I have all these, this is where that Evans collection of material in Savannah was, well, it was so important for many reasons. It's the reason I did the book. But I have many testimonies in newspapers later in the 1870s, 1880s, of people writing into their paper and describing the first time they saw Douglas hmm. or the second time they saw Douglas, what he looked like, what he sounded like, what he spoke about, because he was one of those orators that people just wanted to see. D Douglas was must see TV, as we say today. How much would, and, would, would have been natural gift or talent and how much was preparation on Douglas's part? Great question, because there's often this assumption that he was just a natural. No, he had to learn it. And he, well, there was a lot of natural ability here. There's no question. I mean, with language and with cadence and timing and storytelling, he was a great storyteller. He could take you somewhere. But every major Douglas speech, and there are hundreds of them, all the famous ones, exist in a text. He wrote them down. Some of them are 25 pages long. After the Civil War, he tended to produce them in typescript. It was no longer handwritten. And he, you know, he might break from the text commonly, you know, but he had, and, and there's, a, there's a place after the war in a letter where he, he said, he's, I don't know if I forget who he was writing to, but he says, you know, as I get older and older, I've got to have that text with me. I don't trust myself anymore. And I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I break from my text all the time, but I got to have it there. So the idea that he's, he's not just the preacher who says, give me the text and I'll preach on it. He writes these speeches down. 
the 4th of July speech, which is his masterpiece, his greatest speech, that is a work of prose art. And he had it already printed up in a pamphlet form before he delivered it. Because our man was a marketer. He was ready to take it on the road and sell it. And he did that with several other speeches. One other thing I learned about Douglas, and I say it again in the book, is he's one of those people like a lot of us who I'm, I'm totally convinced. He didn't know what he really thought until he sat down to write it. In any crisis, big event happens. Of course, part of that is being a journalist. 16 years, he edits a paper. He's got to get the mm-hmm. paper up. So there's necessity here. But he goes to his desk and he writes down what he thinks. And he takes it out on the road. That's why we get text of so many of these speeches. That's a man preparing. And you can even see it in, in, the, in the writing. He's preparing rhetoric here. He's preparing those crescendos. He's preparing how he's going to use an argument. And it's, it's in the writing where you see the genius of the writer because sometimes he just floats into a metaphor that suddenly helps you understand something. Douglas's prose is prose poetry. And something I wondered about when I was reading all about all of these speeches, I mean, he was literally, it seems like he was giving a speech every day or every other day, <laughs> but the audience is riled up. How do you project well, your voice enough to, to connect with everybody in the back? With great difficulty. Some churches were small, obviously, in New England, small towns. But my God, they, they, some of them are still there. And they, 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 they see 300 people, 400 people. So... There, the projection has to come from deep. This is like it's like singers, it, it, from deep in the in the frame. You, the, you had to learn to use their muscles and their lungs to project out. He had a baritone voice. I mean, he could really project. However, in some of these outdoor settings, and he spoke in hundreds and hundreds of outdoor settings. You do wonder how many people actually heard anything. Because there are no microphones. There are no megaphones. There is no amplification whatsoever. I'll give you one example. In uh, 1847, he does a final tour with Garrison. They were calling it the 100 Conventions Tour. And by final, I mean it is the last time they toured together. I don't think they planned it that way, but it was. And to make a long story short, by the time they got out to western Pennsylvania and into Ohio, they were speaking in what was known as the Oberlin Tent. It was a tent created in Oberlin, Ohio, an abolitionist town, that they claimed they could get between two and 3,000 people inside the tent. And they could fold that baby up in all of its poles and put it in the back of a wagon and take it to the next town. And they would pitch this thing in fields. And farmers and people would come in carriages and wagons and on horseback thousands of people. It was like the traveling salvation show. And they'd have a little podium at the front and a little stage. And Douglas and Garrison and maybe one or two others would hold forth and try to reach the back of the tent. Well, Garrison got deathly sick on this tour. First, uh, just a respiratory condition that developed apparently into pneumonia and worse. He was shipped off to Cleveland where they thought he was on his deathbed. Douglas started losing his voice, and they would have to cancel once in a while because you you try to do that every day. Go out and shout outside. You know, it's like you know, if you go to a basketball game and you shout for a whole half of a, of a game, you lose your voice. <laughs> he was doing this every day. Later on in life, I have numerous newspaper accounts. Again, the Evans scrapbooks were just full of this stuff because the family hired a clipping service. And everywhere the old man went, there was a clipping, small towns. But there'd be a report. It would say, Mr. Douglas's speech on Thursday night at the local ice rink, which they'd use in the summer, for, or wherever, has been canceled because he's lost his voice. He will resume on Friday or whatever. Many of those cases, he just has to say, I, I can't do it today, I've lost it. He writes letters back to his kids or family and says, that throat ailment, that throat problem is back, you know, which meant he'd gone hoarse. And he probably used all sorts of, I mean, today people drink tea and lemon, and, you know, actors have their methods and so on. And I'm sure they had their methods. But this was part of the routine. And I'll give you a quick thought on this. 
I w- you know, I had studied Douglas on and off all of my life, but until writing this biography and the kind of detail I was trying to reach, I had never quite grasped the physical and mental challenge of this kind of speaking tours. He would do these, especially in the winter. He'd go for three and four months at a time. This is after the war when he's an aging man because you didn't do it in the summer because it was farming time. It was planting and harvest and all the rest. And the farmers were too busy. There's still a farming culture out in the Midwest. He'd go on these three and four month tours. He'd speak on an average of every other day, town after town after town after town. And so I started looking into stage coaches, what were trains really like? How fast mm-hmm. did they go? How bad was the soot? What was a tavern hotel really like in Racine, Wisconsin? Yeah, because he's wearing these starch shirts. I mean, oh, my, yeah. my starch shirt gets dar- dirty after one day. One day, I imagine. yeah. <laughs> no, and you know, and he's got to launder it somewhere, and he's alone. He is right. alone on most of these tours. Way late in life, in the 80s and early 90s, he started traveling with a grandson-in-law who traveled with him. And he would ask for extra money for for his travel. He had one attendant with him. But he'd come back with three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 from one of these tours. He was getting $100 to $150 a pop. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot today, but it was serious money. That is how this man made a living to support a huge extended family of four surviving children and 21 grandchildren and even some fictive siblings and whatnot who were always hanging around, and they were almost all dependent on him. Yeah, it was so, going out as quickly as it was coming in. It absolutely. Like. Well, he saved some of it, and he invested, he invested in real estate, actually. He was quite a businessman, not always successful, but uh, he was so, always investing in apartments and houses, and, uh, and he was always telling his sons, you know, to own things. So let's talk a little bit about his rise to stardom, right? After his first book comes out, he would carry the books with him on tours, Mm -hmm. kind of like a little merch store, (laughs) and it was a bestseller, right? What would that have been like for a young man in his 20s, having written a bestseller, never been to school a day in his life? Half the country's in slavery, you, yeah. you know. Well, I think the best way to imagine that is when he goes to England. He's 27 years old. He's just published the narrative in the summer of 1845. He goes to England in August. It was a planned trip. He wasn't just trying to escape because he'd published his autobiography, although there's something to that. And he took boxes full of the narrative, but he couldn't keep it in print. And he had a second edition published in Dublin in Ireland. Actually, there were two Irish editions published while he was in the British Isles, just to keep the thing in print, because everywhere he would go, he would sell it for a dollar, dollar and a half. And he could get up in front of these audiences and say, I'm not only telling my stories, but here's my story. I am contrary to what you grew up thinking. Black people write. Black people have histories. They have lives. Here it is. And then he would go on speaking about whatever the topic was, which if it was Scotland, it was religious hypocrisy. But that narrative in his hands, I've always felt must have been like magic. I mean, I understand the thrill of holding your first book in your hands. You, you do too. I mean, there is, you know, and we have education, we have a lot of education. But I, I, hell, I made an altar for my first book in my apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I did just a little altar. There were flowers. I put the book up at you know, that was before photos with our phones. So it was that way for him. With the second autobiography, his sons were old enough then, or two of them were. He took them on the road with him at times. And they would peddle the book to the audience for dollar fifty or whatever it was while he was speaking. Hey, it was the family income. <laughs> and it worked. Bondage and Freedom sold 18,000 copies in the first year it was out. Mm. And a lot of us would be thrilled with that. Today, you know, an 18,000 sale of a book is serious. So it appears as though his writing the, in the book was a little more serious than his speaking, though. You mentioned having, he had a lot of humor. He you know, wove a lot of humor into his talks. He did. It's a side of Douglas 
if people know him at all, don't necessarily think of because the photographs of Douglas are so earnest and mm -hmm. serious and important. But he was funny as hell on the stage or the stump as a storyteller. But yeah, the writing, especially the autobiographies, are very earnest. They're moral. They're, they're a moral tale. Uh, they're a moral cautionary tale. They're moral Jeremiads for the country, warning you: here's my story. But if you don't find something to, something important to do about this slavery question, it's going to explode on you. And that's why the second autobiography, I, I always say, although it's much longer and is not as often taught because it's 430 pages. But that's the book that is so political and even has a great deal in it on the possible uses of violence and the way that he tells his story. That book is a warning to the country. It's 1855, after all. The whole slavery crisis has exploded across the country. Bleeding Kansas is happening, et cetera, et cetera. But he could write in many forms. This is a crucial point. This man mastered the short form political editorial, you know, the 600 to 1,000 word editorial, mm -hmm. week after week after week on any subject. He mastered the long form autobiography. He mastered speech making, which has to be written in an oratorical sermonic style. And he wrote one novella. It's not that great, The Heroic Slave, 1852. It's pretty, it's interesting, it's pretty good. What did he had attempted fiction more often? Although some people say the autobiographies are damn good fiction. <laughs> uh, you know, the, well, they are in a way. It's it's great yeah. storytelling. Anyway, so he mastered these many different forms of writing, which you know not everybody can do, even if they're an accomplished writer. And he did some of that greatest writing in crisis moments of his life. I mean, really difficult personal times in his life, which is not uncommon for a lot of great artists, but it's certainly true here, like the early 1850s. His whole life is coming apart in the 1850s. He can't even feed his family. His newspaper almost dies every week or every month. Uh, he goes through this terrible public breakup with Garrison, this personal scandal, but he produces his greatest speech, his one novella, and his greatest long-form masterpiece in Bondage and Freedom and some of the the best editorials ever written in the history of abolitionism, all in a three or four year period. And, he, and while he was having, I'm convinced, a kind of nervous breakdown. What was his mental state during that time? No way to know for sure, except we have a number of letters. And the letters are particularly by Julia Griffiths, this English woman who came to Rochester, lived with the Douglas family for six years, became Douglas's confidant, dearest friend and co-editor of the newspaper or assistant editor and his fundraiser. This was a brilliant, intrepid English woman he had met in England. She was three or four years older. It was alleged they had an affair in his own house by the Garrisonians, although my uh, educated guess on that is that, that never really did happen. Not in that case anyway. But she was crucial to him. She wrote lots and lots of letters that describe, and she's writing these letters often to Garrett Smith, the rich abolitionist in upstate New York, always trying to raise money from him. But she writes about him being bedridden, unable to use his limbs, feeling mm. quote unquote suicidal, unable to work for a month at a time. In fact, and he admitted it in his own newspaper. We have it in his own words. He at times in the newspaper would say, I am unable to perform this month. Julia Griffiths will be editing the paper. I am bedridden. Mm. He's 30, you know, he's like 34 years old. But here he is, this so-called self-made man who can barely feed his kids. He's got five children at home. Anna's trying to raise five children. Julia and her sister purchased the mortgage on his house so he didn't lose his house. She raised money over and over and over so the newspaper would survive. And the only way this man had to make a living was that newspaper, which was a net loss every month, and going on the road all the rest of his time and hope that he'd get paid to speak. That is the only income he had. And he was even following up with people to, to get subscription money and Absolutely. things like that for the newspaper. The newspaper on the back page every month, every week, 
would have the list of people who hadn't paid up their subscription. It was like he'd whack them. And in fact, it got almost insulting the way he would, he would list your name. You haven't paid in six months, you know, because that's, and he, he only had four or 500 subscribers, but that paper survived for 16 years. How did it do compared to The Liberator? Well, The Liberator had a broader audience and it goes okay. all the way back to 1831. I mean, The Liberator lasted uh, well over 30 years. Well, in terms of subscription, like give us context for 400 subscribers versus well, what, an Liber- abolitionist paper. I don't know paper. what the Liberator had, honestly, especially by the late four. The Liberator fell off in the 1850s because Garrison's own popularity fell off. But that was the most widely read, widely known, subscribed anti-slavery newspaper of all. And it was a kind of a repository for all kinds of things. But, you know, four or 500 subscribers was enough to sustain it if they did pay up. But, you know, you had to buy ink, you had to buy paper. And, and there are records here, you know, of, of the monthly paper bill. And that's how he introduced his sons into printing. It became a family business. And the kids later write about it. They say, you know, they sometimes, many weeks, they would take Friday off school. Because that was the day, I guess they, they set type on Thursday and Friday was the day of printing and Saturday was the day they mailed it. It was the family business. Yeah. Boys grew up doing that. They probably didn't know the thing is losing money and, uh, you know, you're going to eat the same vegetables tonight you ate last night. But there was Anna back at the home uh, building a great garden, creating a domestic world in which these kids could grow up. Uh, a domestic world that Douglas could feel safe and secure about. And they had this kind of partnership marriage, clearly, that mostly worked. But here is this budding, growing, eventually world-class intellectual who actually could not share much of that intellectual world with his wife. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not Totally surprising if, if you really get down and understand the 19th century. Most women in the 19th century were, were domestic. They just mm-hmm. were. And for Anna, you know, she has a lot of health problems later on, but she has these five beautiful kids. Well, the fifth, her namesake, Annie, of course, is going to die at only age 11. And that was a horrible tragedy in the family. She's got these five beautiful kids she's trying to raise, they're trying to get them all. And they all did get an education. In fact, his daughter, his oldest, Rosetta, got the best education of all of them. She even had personal tutors. I mean, Douglas was determined that they be to some extent educated, that his sons never got to go to any kind of college is, is largely because of the war. All three of them got caught up in the army. One as a recruiter, the other two in the army, and they were in their early 20s. And when they, when the war was over and they got out of the army, and then his oldest, Lewis, barely survived his wounds from Fort Wagner, they wanted to make money. They wanted to find a way to go into business, and they tried all kinds of things, most of which failed. This idea of going to college just wasn't the same thing it is now. And I've been asked this many times, why didn't Douglas send his boys to college? Well, in the wake of the war, they wanted money. They wanted to get married, have families, and make a living. After all, their dad didn't go to college, and look at him. He's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's an amazing family in a, in a sense. It's a very modern family in some ways and a, and a very 19th century family in some other ways. He really only gave a handful of speeches. I mean, he would give the same talk for years well, at a on. time. Later on, that's true. He had a set of standard speeches. He had the self-made man speech. He had this speech and that speech. In the late 1860s, he was using the composite nation speech, which is one of his most brilliant. Well, although there were many others later on, but yeah, he had a, a repertoire he would take on the road with him. And he at times would even complain, I am so tired of giving this speech. In fact, I'll give you one example. I think it's 1869, for that year's tour, he decided it was time to show his chops as a historian. <laughs> so he decided he was going to write this whole formal speech about European history. 
Because, you know, if, if you were really educated, you knew your European history. <laughs> and he decided the figure he would write about was William the Silent of the Netherlands, of Holland, who was this monarch who also became the leader of the Dutch Republic. It was, it was the history of how the Holland became a republic. Okay, a good story for Americans. So he, he did all his reading, and he did research on this, and he has, has this speech called William the Silent, and we have typescripts of this thing. It's like 25 pages long. He took this baby on the road that winter, and even into the next year, and it bombed on him. <laughs> it oh. just bombed. It was like, what are you doing? They didn't want to hear about William the Silent. And I have one example of a newspaper. For some reason, I remember it being Iowa City. He's, he's in Iowa City in the dead of winter, and he's just giving William the Silent again, and a reporter walks up to him and then records this dialogue he had with Douglas, and he says, Mr. Douglas, you, you just didn't seem to be yourself last night. Uh, the old fire didn't seem to be there. And he admits something about, well, you know, this speech, I really tried to do some careful history, and maybe it's not working that well. And the guy keeps prodding him on this. And, and then Douglas says something like, yeah, well, you know, if I really belt it out like I used to, I got false teeth now, and they may fall out. And, and he's trying to humor this reporter. And then finally the reporter asks him, Mr. Douglas, what's the hardest part of being out on these kinds of tours for you? And I love the answer because he said, having to talk to people like you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but by God. <sighs> That's perfect. Awesome. That's perfect. But anyone, yeah. you know, he's probably sitting in a lonely train station or something, you know. Yeah. And but that's that William the Silent thing did bomb. And I have some other newspaper reports that basically say that. Why is he talking about this? We want to hear about Reconstruction. We want to hear about. But he probably felt like, you know, I'm out there every year doing this now, and I need to show that I have something to say other than the same old thing. Well, in the early days, he would be getting in fights after his talks, and then... Those were violent yes. times, the 1840s, 1850s, you know, yeah. when and abolitionists then, were scary people. And then now, after, after the, the Civil War, War he, he, had a, he kind of felt a sense of, I think, personal irrelevance. A little um, bit, yeah, yeah. And he had to keep establishing that over and over. And eventually, of course, but it doesn't happen until 1877, he starts getting these federal appointments. Rutherford Hayes appoints him Marshal of the District of Columbia, which doesn't sound too sexy, but it was actually a pretty important position in D.C. Right. And then he gets, uh, by Garfield, he's appointed Recorder of Deeds, which is like, it's the office running all real estate operations in Washington, D.C. It doesn't sound sexy either, but it was a well-paying federal job. And then he stayed off the road more during those appointments, although he still did a lot of lecturing, especially on the East Coast. Now he had a real job every day and eight or 10 clerks to manage and so on. And by the way, when he's appointed recorder of deeds, he gets eight clerks. And you know where I'm going with this. The first four <laughs> are his daughter and his three sons. And in the DC newspapers, he's accused over and over of nepotism. And he finally just said, okay, all right, fine. My kids need jobs. End of story. That's why they had civil service reform. You weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> but yeah, they needed jobs. And he, he pointed them all. And, it was, it was, and that was the family business. <laughs> I read this quote in my, some of my research, and it talked about Shortly before Douglas's death, a young black man solicited some advice from him. Yeah, yeah. I've always wondered if that's apocryphal, but... Probably. <laughs> probably. I never found that, but it's been used many, many times. Well, something like that, no doubt, happened because people came to Cedar Hill all the time. The, the house mm -hmm. he eventually lived in up in Anacostia. It's amazing that he would allow them to do that. They would just show up and want to talk to Mr. Douglas. There might be a reporter, there might be anybody. And apparently... A young man said, what would you give? What advice would you give? Agitate, agitate, agitate is a great answer. And, you know, what that reflects, whether it happened or not, or happened in some other variation, is Douglas was always preaching this kind of thing to the next generation. 
And he was always being accused of falling out of touch with the next generation by the next generation of black leaders. And he had these, frankly, several bitter rivalries with some of them because they were all college educated. And here was this great Douglas who never set foot in a school. But he was always trying to speak to the next generation and make sure it's just like today when you when you hear an, an old civil rights activist who's still alive, they're desperate to make sure that young people don't forget the movement, don't forget what was sacrificed. It's, a lot of this happened around the John Lewis death. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing Douglas was doing by the 1880s and 1890s. Don't forget slavery. Don't forget the slave power. Don't forget white supremacy. White supremacy is more virulent now than it was then, you would tell them. Now, on some issues, the accusations that he fell out of touch sometimes stuck. His eternal support of the Republican Party, although he was at times very critical of the Republican Party, he never gave up on it. Of course, there was nowhere else to go either. His stand on the Kansas exodus was, uh, he was pretty lonely in that stand. And there are other issues. He took a lot of heat for his performance as U.S. ambassador to Haiti, although (laughs) he got trapped in that situation. Anyway, there was always this accusation that Douglas was always, imagine this, was only out for himself. He get these federal appointments, you know, he, he knew all the right people, he he had his toes inside the government. He was an insider, 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 and no longer the great radical outsider. Well, there was a lot of truth to that. It actually is, in, in a biographical sense, what makes him so fascinating. You know, what happens to the old radical outsider when you do get inside of power a little bit? What compromises do you make? What deals do you have to muster? And, and think of what we've experienced in, in the last decades all the civil rights leaders who became mayors and congressmen and senators and and so on, and who got inside of power. Some of them performed beautifully and well, and some perhaps not. But Douglas is the original prototype for that. He talked in a letter about the duplicity and the greed and everything that he was experiencing in Washington. Do you think he involved himself in any of that? The actual corruption, no. I mean, did he understand the spoil system and the buttering of bread in that era? The Gilded Age? Yes. And was he a Gilded Age gentleman in Washington, D.C., uh, at times with a foothold in the government? Yes. Another thing to understand about Douglas is that way back, the beginning of his abolitionist career, and then it's surely when he established his independence and went to Rochester and has his own newspaper, He had always had patrons. He had many British friends who had been financial supporters of his newspaper and even of his family at times. He learned early on. He has no education, no other business, no other way to make a living, but people were giving to the cause. And the cause might mean a little help for Douglas's family, a little help to educate his daughter, a little help to keep that newspaper alive, a little help to maybe publish that book. You know, patrons. Uh, it's an old, old, ancient. You know, think about the rena- There's no Renaissance without the patrons, and he had American patrons to some degree. Garrett Smith, in particular. So, so he had experience with all of that. I don't know of any cases, you know, where he took money from Republican donors and and politicians. Uh, he he took he took the appoint of jobs, and he had a salary. It was either recorder of deeds or, or marshal. I forget which. It paid about eight thousand dollars a year. That that was. Hey, that's as much as I was paid as a high school teacher in 1971. I thought, man, that's not bad. <laughs> you know, and then he would start investing some of that in real estate and so on and so forth. There were all kinds of rumors when he died that, of how much money he was worth. And you, may, you know this because you've read the book. One of the most stunning things in his papers at the Library of Congress in particular are the begging letters that he gets mm. late in his life from young African-Americans. He couldn't say no, it seems. Well, he had a little trouble with that. There's no question about that. But he did start saying no, or sometimes I think he just ignored people. But he would get letters from teenage African-Americans, and they would call him, oh, great Douglas, Mm -hmm. oh, oh, leader of our race. It was like he was some African potentate or something. It was, there are hundreds of these. 
and they would be asking for, can you, do you have 25, do you have whatever dollars so that I can attend uh, the normal school? Can you help us out here because we're trying to create such and such? We want to build a church. On and on it would go. And it gives you a window into this world of African Americans trying to imagine a new future in what is becoming now the Jim Crow South. And my God. And there's this guy, and they all know who he is. And they get his address, you know. Right. He, and speaking of which, he had uh, the rumor mill was happening around his personal life, too. He, he married a white woman as the most oh. famous black man in oh, yeah, yeah. the oh. world. And one entire scrapbook in the Evans collection is devoted to clippings about that marriage. This went on for months. The scandalous newspaper coverage of Douglas's marriage to Helen Pitts. Most famous black man on earth marries a white woman 20 years younger in 1884. Now, that would be news today, you know. Some, right. But uh, people were exaggerating, oh, she's 30 years younger, oh, she's God, 40 yeah, years yeah. younger. By the, time, by the time that spun out. He was 90 and she was 20. Yeah, exactly. It was bizarre what went on with this thing. And it was a real scandal. He took the heat from blacks, whites, but he also had defenders and friends on all sides. Not really among his adult children, though. They never really warmed up to Helen, which is a story in itself. She basically moved in and took over the house at Cedar Hill. You know, and they had always seen it as their mother's house or their mother's place. It's not, not an uncommon reaction. But by all accounts, it was a great marriage. The last 11 years of his life, he had this very well-educated companion. They read all kinds of books together. They traveled together. She appeared with him all the time together. It was almost like they were, they were flouting it. They were saying, you don't think this is right? Well, that's your problem. And, of course, they did an 11-month tour of Europe and the Mediterranean together, on which he kept an extraordinary diary, mm. uh, uh, which I made the most of. <laughs> but Did he ever need a bodyguard? Because even with Helen Pitts, he got into a couple of fights. Oh, yeah. Like physical fights with people. Well, I think that's why he's, that's one of the reasons he started traveling with this grandson-in-law in the late 80s and the 90s, and also because of his health. Uh, I'm convinced he had, he had heart disease long before he died of it. He never technically had a bodyguard. Hmm. You know, there's no one listed as body man or bodyguard. Because people would, like, stop him and recognize him all the time, right? All the time. I discussed this in the book that he, he had a terrible problem with fame. Today we call it celebrity. And he had all the, well, you could say he had the pleasures of it, but he had all the perils of it. I think he was, without doubt, one of the most well-known of all Americans, especially after he appeared on the cover of Harper's Weekly, which was like being on Time magazine. His picture was, it was like 1872. And then all the photographs. There's very good evidence that Douglas may have been the most photographed American of the 19th century. There's some little dispute about whether Grant had done more photographs, but, but there are about 164 extant photographs of Douglas today. There are probably more out there yet to be found. His image was common. And of course, he had that stunning visual image but when in his later life the hair had gone white he always wore a top hat on it he was six foot one and a half almost six two which was tall and anywhere he appeared everybody knew who he was and i also speculate in the book that he may have been heard by as an orator uh, more americans than any other american of that century it's just hard to come up with anyone else who who was such an itinerant traveling lecturer to the extent he was. Mark Twain eventually, you know, but Twain lives into the 20th century. And Twain probably traveled more miles than Douglas, but that's because Twain went abroad more. Uh, but I, I even speculate that Douglas may have traveled more miles than any other American of the 19th century. This was just part of his life, a constant part of his life. And Anna, by the way, in their 44 years of marriage, never traveled with him. Mm. He, never, he only mentioned her like once or something like that in his biographies, right? Mm-hmm. And she's called my wife. <laughs> Talk about absences and silences. He almost never mentions the children either. They're just not there. 
the story is about him and whoever else can help build that story. It's disappointing. I mean, when you read it, you think, wait a minute here, uh, there's a family here. There's, there's a wife here making this life happen. But it all depends on how, what you read it for. Right. You want to know about the evolving abolitionist great man, or do you want to know about the context of the 1850s? Or, you know. But even in life and times, when he spreads out so much more, it's much longer and full of incredible, wonderful detail about his post-1850s life. Anna's nowhere to be found. Helen is mm. mostly about their tour of Europe. He makes a big deal out of that. He writes a whole chapter on it. Although not much of it is actually about Helen either. <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's always Douglas telling us about that single character that he started inventing in the first abolitionist speech he ever gave. Mm. It is, in a way, it's almost like Although Douglas wrote about and spoke about a thousand other issues brilliantly, it's like he always knew that in the end he had one great story to tell, and that was about himself. Mm. And the world wanted to know that, and he never stopped doing it. What was his greatest achievement? Oh, I think it's in words. The man is a prose poet. He is the prose poet of American democracy to me. We know him in the words. I mean, we know him in the actions and the deeds and in creating the newspaper and, and the, you know, the heroism of escaping slavery and all of that. But we know this man in his words. 1,200 pages of autobiography, thousands of pages of the speeches, hundreds upon hundreds of those editorials. It's what he left us in his mastery of language about the meaning of America, the meaning of freedom, the meaning of slavery. I mean, his writing more than anybody penetrates to that world of what did slavery actually mean physically, but even more importantly, mentally. What was its potential to ruin the human spirit? No one wrote about it like he did. And then you can look at political subjects. You can look at the Constitution. I mean, there, there are lots of essays have been written now by law school professors on Douglas's constitutional thought. He became a student of the Constitution. He became a student of political liberalism, this idea of natural rights. In fact, there are no less than three books now by at least three, there's probably another one, by political theorists about Douglas as a major thinker about the natural rights tradition. In the end, it is Douglas, the writer, the thinker, that will, you know, always endure. I mean, the image of Douglas is this you know, virile, heroic figure who overcame slavery. And if you, if you listen to the Republicans' convention, of course, he was one of theirs as a Republican, which just turns my stomach every time they say it. <laughs> but it's in the words. In the introduction to Bondage and Freedom, which is done by James McCune Smith, his dear friend, his mm -hmm. best black male friend I think Douglas ever had. Douglas wasn't real good at making close friendships, by the way. Mm -hmm. But... In McKinnon Smith's introduction to Bondage and Freedom, he said, he calls Douglas, you know, a master of language in ways that are hard to even explain. But he said he used usable, doable words. Usable, doable <laughs> words. And Smith was himself a great intellectual. But that says something about Douglas. He, he could be eloquent, and then he could also be very declarative. Uh, but I, I always say, if anybody really wants to understand the problem of slavery in America, the problem of race in America, just start by reading Douglas. And you may, you may stay there for about two years because there's so much to work with. Even at the end of his life, that speech, that last great speech of his life is about lynching, called Lessons mm -hmm. of the Hour. That still holds up. It's kind of a three-part analysis of why lynching was happening. It's actually pretty good history. Still, you know, uh, and he wrote it first in 1893. The only Was that one, the speech he gave on that last day that he had the heart attack? The no. The speech? No, he, he didn't. Not on the last day. In fact, he didn't even give a speech the last day. He just sat on a platform at a women's rights convention. Ah. They just wanted him to be there to appear, you know, mm. just be Douglas. No, but he had given it dozens and dozens of times in 93 and all through 94 
and then he dies in uh, uh, February of 95. And he kept honing it and changing it. The Lessons of the Hour speech was his last speech he took out on the road. But he was already a sick man. He was writing letters back at that point, complaining about how his hands would shake and he couldn't write well anymore and he didn't breathe well anymore. That's a man with heart disease Mm -hmm. (laughs) who probably didn't even know it because cardiology wasn't quite even invented yet. Mm -hmm. It was about to be, but he probably had everything from blocked arteries to angina to who knows what and just didn't know it. (laughs) As someone who's poured over all the Douglas papers and studied his life for years, decades even, say you had, just hypothetically, you had a chance to have a lunch with Douglas. You could go back in time and have lunch with Douglas. What would you ask him? What gap would you want filled out if you only had an hour of his time? You know, over time, I have developed a list of like uh, three dozen questions. I, you know, I, I, <laughs> You've already I, thought about this. Well, I, I started joking with audiences, you know, oh, if we could ever bring back, here's what. And I've, I have a whole list over here. Just as a, as, the, as a biographer, I want to know things like, what did you read before you wrote that Fourth of July speech? What were you, you know, because mm-hmm. there's a letter where you say you worked on it for three weeks. I want to know what you were reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to know. I want to know what you really thought of Abraham Lincoln in 1863, and so on. And so, but my first question would be, Mr. Douglas, Anna, discuss. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, please. The whole letting a woman live in the house with them and all of that stuff. Well, I or? just want him to talk about her, right, Anna, and get as sentimental as you want. You know, be as protective and defensive as you want, but please just talk about it because he never, mm. he never did. He surely did with his children at times. He surely did maybe. Well, actually, we do have a couple of letters where he (laughs) reflects quite openly on Anna with other people, but not much. Mm -hmm. I would just want him to talk. And maybe it would flow into a discussion then of the children. It might flow into a discussion of Helen later, you know, and so on. That kind of thing he just never wrote down for us. And Mm -hmm. I think it would be so revealing of his... You know, his personal standing, you know, his sense of his own soul. Uh, 44 years, Mr. Douglas, and talk about it, you know. Today in our, you know, our talk culture, it's kind of what we're doing, but in our talk culture, this is the sort of stuff he could never have avoided. Right. When he, but when he did interviews, nobody went there. Nobody asked about this. The interviews were always very public issues. Well, would that there had been the 1893 sit-down with Frederick Douglass where some journalist just got him to talk at great length, you know, but that... Well, maybe there is, and, and maybe that'll be the next book you have to Actually, write. Actually, I think he you discover far, that? I think he was far too clever to let anybody do that. <laughs> <laughs> no one was going to get there. There's one journalist who showed up once to Cedar Hill, and the family was out playing croquet in the backyard, which they did, and... Uh, uh, he sits down on a bench with the journalist and he takes the journalist inside and he did conduct an interview and it's a pretty interesting interview, but it's all about issues. It's about issues. That's the kind of one where you wished, come on, go there, talk more about the life. But then there, you know, there are, there are a hundred other political questions I want to ask him too. <laughs> one of the things that I noticed about your interviews, you, you're really excited about chapter titles. And I'm just curious as a biographer, where does that come from? And then second question mm. is you refer to Douglas a lot by these monikers, the sage of Cedar Hill, the orator of Rochester. Yeah. Was that stuff yeah. that you got from letters that you wrote? Or was it, did you, did, were you just being creative and coming up with all of those throughout the book? Those are all real phrases that were used back then. Uh, like like the one old man eloquent that was the old man eloquent yeah no in, in the later years that was always in the press sometimes he wasn't even called douglas he was just called old man eloquent <laughs> and you were supposed to know who that was <laughs> <laughs> i don't know the chapter titles well prose poet of american democracy that's mine so people can use it if they want that's mine chapter titles in in biography at least this one i tried to make almost all of them brief quotations from him so mm-hmm. that I was, and this, again, this is where the autobiographies come in. I'm using his own language. Not all of them are that way. I use Paul Dunbar's, a piece from Paul Dunbar's poem on the chapter on Douglas's war propagandist. I mean, you can't avoid a phrase like, 
the kindling spirit of his war cry. <laughs> and sometimes you read a phrase and you think, oh my God, that's a chapter title. I'll give you an example. He comes back from England in 47 and he is really an angry young man. He's just had this flowering all over the British Isles where he's been treated like this hero. And he's experienced only marginal kinds of racism. And now he's coming back into the hothouse of American slavery and racism, and he's bitter. And he's so fiery in the speeches he's given. And even some of the, uh, uh, his own friends, like Wendell Phillips took him aside at one point and said, Fred, uh, tone it down, man. A Philadelphia newspaper called him the demagogue in black. And I thought, chapter title, that's it. <laughs> that's what that chapter is going to be called, because that's what he was at that point. You know, anyway, so... I like to play with chapter titles largely because it tells me where that chapter is going. It may or may not, but it's kind of a way of confining the scope of this chapter. Mm-hmm. But biography, I think you can do that. Other kinds of history, it's not necessarily the case. I used to start out chapters with longer epigraphs, you know, little mm-hmm. quotes. Now I try to keep those very short because I know readers don't read long quotes. Mm. It's got to be tight. You know? That's just something you learn over time. I remember using three epigraphs on some of the chapters in my first book, and I thought, no one's going to read the third one. I mean, was... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. And where do you go from here? I mean, you've done this thing. It's won the biggest prize a book can win. You've dissected Douglas to death. What's next for you? Well, I've committed to a new biography of James Walden Johnson. Okay. The great, uh, well, he was everything, the polymath who became head of the NAACP, but before Mm -hmm. that, novelist, poet, diplomat, musical lyricist, uh, author of the Black National Anthem. His papers are all right here at the Beinecke Library at Yale, which has been closed all summer, and I've not been allowed to use them. But uh, there's, there has not been a modern biography of James Weldon Johnson since 1971. Mm. And he's a huge figure. You know, he's born in 1871, dies 1937 in a car accident. But he lived this incredible life, uh, born in Florida in Jacksonville, ends up a kind of consummate New Yorker. He's a very different figure from Douglas. He's, he's, he's more full of rectitude and so on. But my God, he did everything. He was a total polymath and a writer, always a writer. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing a new biography of JWJ. Is that like a five-year-long process? Kind of like Oh, I hope I can do it in five. It just got delayed like crazy. This was going to be my summer of research. His papers are right there like one mile from my apartment. I mean, wow. Crazy. They tell me next week, I guess early September, they're going to let us back into the libraries by appointment only. Mm. That's how close. I'm surprised you don't have a key to the no, <laughs> no, no. You, well, you they have a backstage any, pass. Well, they haven't even had any staff in the art. Uh, so got it. They weren't allowed to be there. So anyway, that's the next project. So in the absence of doing the research, I've just been writing op-eds. <laughs> I love it. I love the one you did for the New York Times. Well, American Jeremiah. It's just not to have something to do and say in <laughs> yeah. misery of these times. I'm trying to work one up now on, I don't know that I'll do it, but on the Republican Party as an American style proto fascism. Mm. That's a strong word, I know, but uh, <laughs> there are elements of what they're doing that. that fit the story. I don't know that I'll pull that off. There's, there's too much I need to read about fascists. <laughs> well, yeah, and there's so many parallels too uh, with what's happening now, as you, as you well know, what's happening now and what happened in post reconstruction and Douglas's uh, later, uh, later days. And uh, I was, I was kind of teasing a friend of mine saying I was going to put together a series of Douglas quotes and you have to guess whether they were contemporary quotes or. Oh, quotes that's a great idea. From Douglas You're really Reckon. good. Yeah, <laughs> you could. Or you okay. could just not put any names on them and say, that's right. you said that and when? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, John Lewis, 1960, yeah. maybe? or nope. Mark Frederick Kennedy. Douglass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you so much, man. I, I want to just uh, take a moment and, 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 and just thank you for your commitment and yeah. for, okay. you know, I, I, 
I've read a fair amount of biographies in my life and, and, you know, the writings is sometimes at a level that you have to kind of bear with it just to get the story. But I was impressed. I was very, very impressed by your prose. And it almost sounds like it was a ghost writer who wrote that book <laughs> and not a college professor. Don't tell. But... <laughs> Don't tell. Well, that's one, of no. the, that's one of the myths about all this elitism that the right in this country keeps portraying about academics and university professors and all this. You know, we're not a bunch of just theoretical elitists. You know, some of us are just storytellers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that was your mission. It was uh, mission accomplished. So thank you well, for thank making you it very accessible. Much. This has been fun. I got to tell you, you do a great interview. And oh, thank you. <laughs> no, but it begins with the fact that you read so carefully. It really is amazing. It's terrific. I mean, it's not everybody does that. <laughs> I, I was nervous because you've done so many of these interviews with so uh, many like really important people. And it's just no, like, no, oh. this was fun. Honestly, this was great. Thank you. Uh, we got inside the story. We really did. Thank well, you. let me. And there's so much. There's so much we didn't cover. Oh, I've got like pages and pages, and but you know, people will just have to read the book. I mean, that's the best thing. You can't summarize 900 pages in in you know a couple of hours. It's gotta. You gotta put the time in. How do you in, put but these out? Like, how do you do you put these out just on podcast networks? Or? It's just podcast. Yeah, it's just going to be an audio podcast. Sure. I do them. I'll put this out probably in the next maybe in a month or so I got an opportunity to interview Ava DuVernay recently, which I, oh, yeah. I was really excited about. And so oh. I want to do a little series of, of these kinds of things, but I, I've recently started doing historical figures. I, you know, I just, it just kind of came to me one day. Yeah. yeah. I've been interviewing people who are starting movements and building yeah. awareness around things contemporary, but I've always thought about Frederick Douglass's story. It needs to be, you know, mm -hmm. he needs to have a whole series of graphic novels or something because it's just amazing. Well, no, At least the way he tells it is, yeah. is quite amazing. And to have you contextualize it is is just it just brought so much more light to Douglas's humanity of, you know, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm now on the speaking circuit. I'm now writing books. So I have that to relate to as a man in his 40s to what Douglas was experiencing. And it just brought so much more depth yeah. to the story. Well, hopefully we'll be back out on the road at some point. With real yeah, hopefully. You know, hopefully. I had a whole series of talks canceled last spring and early summer, just a dozen of them, and poof. I done. can imagine, yeah. I mean, you well, were giving so many talks. Most of them turned into podcasts later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what's interesting about your story is that if you hadn't, if you weren't so generous with your time, you probably would not have been down in Savannah talking to these teachers, you know, who then well, introduced you to Walter true. Evans. Well, that was, that, was, that was blind good luck, too. Just yeah. Bumping into that collection, which, by the way, is now here at Yale. Yeah, what was he going to do with it anyway? What was his original idea? Was he a writer or? No, Walter was a surgeon. Yeah. He spent his life as a practicing surgeon in Detroit and made, you know, made a very good living, plowed it into collecting art, manuscripts, and rare books. And well, he's a, he's a collector who, number one, he knows what he owns and he's very into it. I mean, he's an African-American who knows the history and the literature, but he's a businessman too. He waited out the Yale library here. He waited out the book coming out. He, he, he had an offer for this collection five or six years ago from here at Yale. Uh, I can't say what the numbers are, but, uh, by the time he finally said yes, the number doubled. <laughs> mm. and Did he I, know about you five or six years ago, or, or had he been tracking your career? He knew about me through my first book because he had collected it. Right. So when I met him, which was actually 13 years ago or so, he knew about that I'd written on Douglas, and he just wanted to show me the collection. Because at that point, uh, really no other Douglas scholar had ever used the stuff. There are others who had actually seen it, couple people, but no one had really decided to sit down and work with it. I ended up spending quite a piece of my life in Savannah. Mm. The hell of an archive, the dining room table of these wonderful people. <laughs> mm. I'll Love never that. have an archive like that again, I can assure you. Yeah, it's in, it's in Yale now though, right? The collection is... It is, and it's being digitized as we speak, so the whole world can use it. Oh, beautiful. It's amazing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a culmination of many years... <laughs> 
<laughs> negotiating with him. But I love the man. But boy, he's a good businessman. <laughs> well, man, thanks for just saying yes as many times as you had to oh, say yes bet. to you get bet. to where you oh, are. I and to... it. I really did. Thank you for listening to my interview with Professor Blight, who was gracious enough to come onto the podcast and share the story of Frederick Douglass. This was honestly a dream come true for me, and I really look forward to sharing the backstory of more historical figures on At the End of the Tunnel. Please get yourself a hold of Prophet of Freedom. It's an excellent book. Again, it won the Pulitzer Prize in history, and I found it to be incredibly accessible for the layperson. And if you want to hear more stories like these, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and make sure you check out the archive. I've got so many other wonderful interviews with amazing people who have overcome all kinds of challenges and obstacles in order to start their movement. And as with Douglas, as with Young Pueblo today, Leon Logothetis, and pretty much every other guest I've had on the podcast, what they find is that their biggest obstacle usually plays a role in defining their movement. And each interview reminds us of how we can use our challenges to do whatever we're here on this planet to do. If you like what you hear, please rate the podcast five stars and leave a review. It'll help other people find these inspirational stories. And as always, you can find everything that Professor Blight and I discussed about Frederick Douglass in the show notes, as well as a transcript of our entire interview on my website, which is lightwatkins.com slash tunnel. While you're there, please sign up for my daily dose of inspiration email. It's just a short, sweet, daily inspirational message directly from me every morning at 6 a.m. Pacific time. And if you have any feedback for me or suggestions about other people you'd like to see on the podcast, text it to me. I'll give you my number. Are you ready? It's 323-405-9166. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week with another fascinating conversation from the end of the tunnel.